Hi, I'm Jeff Sachs, Director of the Earth Institute, and absolutely thrilled to welcome you to the 2012 Student Research Showcase. Uh, and I want to welcome, uh, of course, our faculty, uh, research leaders, partners and supporters of the Earth Institute, the general public, and especially the students. Uh, this is for you, uh, and it's also to celebrate your achievements, uh, the students, more than a hundred uh, of whom had the support of the Earth Institute this year. Of course, uh, at the core of the Earth Institute's mission uh, and of Columbia University's mission is education. And we're so proud of what the students are learning. But this is uh, beyond education uh, that you'll see today because the contributions the students uh, are making are, are huge. It's not only to their own learning, but contributions to knowledge uh, and to the world. Uh, it is about problem solving in communities, in New York City, of course, and all over the world. So you see what you have before you are students uh, from across the university who have operated across the globe, across the disciplines of sustainable development uh, and are making us so proud uh, and making us uh, so happy uh, that this uh, bold initiative of Columbia University, the Earth Institute, uh, is seeing its uh, purpose and its mission fulfilled so beautifully by our students. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy this wonderful showcase, and let's all uh, give our gratitude, thanks, uh, and celebration for uh, the students whose research uh, we learn about today. So uh, my research was looking at the impact of increasing cash crop production on local households in the Millennium Village of Monsaso in Ghana. And specifically we're looking at, at how households that are increasing their levels of production change their socioeconomic and environmental relationships. So one of the most interesting things we found from the research was that households that were growing more cash crops were actually more food insecure than households that weren't. Additionally, we found that households that were engaging in cash crop production had better diet diversity but unfortunately this was primarily due to increased consumption of alcohol, tea, and coffee, which was again very contrary to what we expected. I developed a large amount of statistical and analytical skills. Uh, specifically in statistics, I learned how to use the modeling software Stata, which I had never used before, and was able to engage in a series of tests, which I didn't know how to do before, uh, develop a hypothesis, produce a proposal, and run the tests to prove or disprove the hypothesis, which was very useful. It was really special to have the funds and the support to be able to develop something that came completely you know, from my own theories and then see it against real world data how it held up. Overall, I think it was the most educational uh, component of my time at Columbia so far. So as a research assistant for the Earth Institute, I um, conducted research uh, and analysis for the regional partnership to promote trade and investment in Sub-Saharan Africa. And to summarize it shortly, the project aims at um, attract investors and facilitate trade in underfunded, small, medium-sized um, African cities, and um, therefore to enhance growth and alleviate poverty. During the research, I had um, one, one of my tasks was to identify best practices in um, client charters for investment promotion agencies in sub-Saharan um, African countries, and. Um, First of all, um, this was very difficult because apparently sub-Saharan African countries have never heard of client charters. So um, sometimes it was kind of frustrating to go on the websites and see no, um, no client charters at all. Finally, I, I was able to come up with some examples and I really hope that they will um, help the senior advisors of the project um, to come up um, with helpful ideas. And I became interested in the subject area because first of all um, I had several development related courses during my studies and second of all because I believe that the West has a clear obligation to help those countries and cities to alleviate poverty.
Um, I'm a biologist and my project is on integrating the social, economic, and ecological goals of cer coffee certification programs like fair trade and organic. Um, and I got involved in this project because I've been working in an, an ornithology lab with my mentor Melissa Mark, who's a postdoc, and she works mostly in field ornithology, but she's always been wanting to develop these questions, and I have always been interested in social and ecological systems, so our conversations developed into this project. I think it's very important for the Ethan Institute to fund prob projects like mine because it's, it's hard to find funding to do independent research, and I think that doing so, especially in the field, helps you decide if that's what you want to do, and it also, and for me, that's what it did. Um, next year, I'll be working in Peru, looking at similar questions during a one-year fellowship, and I don't think I would have been able to make that decision had I not had this experience and had the confidence to go off and do it on my own. Well, I've been working in development for quite a bit and uh, at uh, SIPA I study um, economic and political development. So um, monitoring and valuation is a very important part of uh, determining impact in any sort of project. Well, when we were looking at uh, skilled birth attendants in um, the uh, 10 Millennium Village project countries, um, we found that we did have a significant impact in uh, the skilled birth attendants from our, our, our villages to the, the regional countries. Well, the way I've done the analysis and the reformatting, it, it's very easy and it's very flexible. So other researchers, um, you know, whatever variable they want to look at, can look at DHS data and look at the Millennium Villages data to uh, do any sort of analysis that they want. And I plan on working on development projects in the future. And you know, the skills that I've learned at the Millennium Villages project will help me do a lot of that monitoring evaluation in the future. The internship that I'm working with is with the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, also known as SEASON, and it's a program here at the Columbia Earth Institute. And the project that I'm working on is called the Global Climate Change and Human Health Project. And what it does is it gives educators the resources, both scientific data and geospatial technology, to engage high school students in critically thinking about how climate change is affecting and impacting human health. There are seven areas that we are focusing on and they are disease, desertification, food security, migration, natural disasters, sea level rising, and water resources. And how we're doing this is with a technology called Change Viewer. And what it is, is it's a global um, GIS data set where students are able to actually go onto this globe and, and go in anywhere in the world and see what the impacts of climate change are going to be in those seven areas. I have taken a class, a short course, six hour course on GIS technology and I thought what better way to actually learn more about GIS technology than doing an internship where I would be using that information and applying it in practical, uh, in a practical application that will actually be, be used by educators and by high school students throughout not only New York State but the entire country. My project was a communications and outreach internship for the Lenfest Center for Sustainable Energy and its initiative supporting artists and scientists collaboration, uh, positive feedback. I feel that one of the most uh, challenging questions we face intellectually is how do we talk about current research about climate change? How do we help people understand it, but more than that, truly connect with this information so that on a personal level, and that's what art and artists do and so through my work with positive feedback uh, and creating outreach for their events I learned that this is possible. We did an event that was uh, a speed dating event between artists and scientists. Very fun, very creative type of event and the outreach I created was personal ads. So scientists seeking artists, uh, artists seeking inspiration for their work um, and it really highlighted the gulf between these two communities and the need for and the desire for greater connections. So I would say that the most interesting thing that I learned and the most rewarding thing for me professionally was that it is possible to do this. You can create at a programmatic level a greater uh, community and greater collaboration between artists and scientists working on climate change. Uh, 
Uh, my project was about how urban planning processes for sustainability was affected by the individual characteristics of the planners, uh, who they talked to and how they talked to them, and the characteristics of the organisations. Um, when this is studied usually, we start by identifying the problems that a city faces and we treat the policy making process as a problem of, uh, problem of searching for the right solutions. Um, I treat it as a social process that's embedded in other social processes and investigate it as such. The biggest challenge was convincing practicing planners to participate in my study, both by responding to interviews and by responding to a survey. Um, because, oh, let's face it, practicing planners are not concerned with participating in research projects usually. Um, I think that persistence and explaining how their input will be important was critical in getting them to participate. We know for, for sure that the urban growth is going to be the growth sector of the 21st century par excellence. And what we do in cities is going to decide whether or not the world will be sustainable. Now, we have a pretty good idea of what's wrong with the current urban systems and what a sustainable urban system should look like. But we've paid less attention to how we are supposed to transition from the existing system to the one that we want. Um, that's a social process and a social science approach would be useful in creating and generating insights that can guide practicing planners in that transition. Studying an urban plan in a book is one thing, but being on the ground and really seeing how a city works is a totally different thing. Um, so going to Chandigarh, India and seeing the plan of Le Corbusier um, taught me uh, how to read a plan and, and what to believe when you're reading an urban plan and what not to read, um, but to also pay attention to uh, how an urban plan can change over time. Broadly speaking, our project was about modernist new towns and trying to figure out what about that totalitarian, top-down, uh, comprehensively planned vision of the city works and what doesn't. Well, Brendan and I, when we were doing our research on Chandigarh, um, we, were, we were constantly plagued with not having information on how the city was currently being used. Uh, it, it, it was very clear, Corbusier had done, a, had done a great job of making the plans um, back when he was designing the city, but um, there weren't good records kept of how the plan was adapted and how people were actually using the city. So we, we, we basically had nothing from the present of how um, people were living day to day and how the city had changed. And so we needed to get there and see what was happening on the ground. I think the most interesting finding of the project is that it's really hard to develop anything other than local expertise. It's really hard to know something as vastly complex as a city without going there and spending time there and speaking with its people and tasting its food and smelling its smells. It makes me think that for really meaningful and comprehensive urban planning that there has to be a lot of involvement from the ground up, from the people who live there and work there and are experts because it's their life. Um, I believe the field of urban planning and sustainable development really go hand in hand very well. Um, understanding how a city works and how people live is crucial to the field of sustainability. And so being able to start to see a little bit of uh, how the world works and how uh, modern urban plans are working um, is, is really important for me to, uh, as I further my field, uh, my, my studies in architecture and sustainable development. I'm very grateful that they made my trip to India more feasible. And it's really great to see this kind of investment in the future happening. I think that there are lots of people who hope to go on to make a difference for the better in this world. Um, and there are a lot of barriers in the way for lots of those people. And I think that it is really important that those barriers get broken down and that those people who want to make a difference are given the resources to do so. The objective of my study was to really evaluate why do some mothers decide to vaccinate their children and others don't. And I wanted to do something different with this study, which was to provide a social explanation for why mothers might or might not decide to vaccinate their children. 
and looking at vaccines as opposed to other kinds of medical care, which are also important in northern Nigeria, um, was a decision I made because an estimated one million children die annually of vaccine-preventable diseases in that state. I faced many challenges while doing this research study. Um, I was lucky because I had support from an immunization program on the ground, but even with that support, I had to independently manage nine field workers to collect nearly 700 interviews across 22 communities in one state in northern Nigeria. And between balancing local politics, managing the budget, managing the staff, dealing with quality control, and at the same time, trying to maintain the integrity of my study design, it proved quite difficult. I have a lot of ideas of how I'd like to develop my research study further. I think it would be very interesting to actually test uh, my research question in the United States even, in areas like rural Colorado or the Bronx, New York, where vaccine uptake and vaccine coverage rates are still quite low. I work on carbon dioxide capture and storage, which is a mechanism for combating the greenhouse effect by preventing human carbon dioxide emissions from reaching the atmosphere. My field site is in Oman, a site of naturally occurring carbon capture and storage. Atmospheric carbon dioxide gets turned into stable carbonate rocks, like limestone. So I study the natural system to figure out how it works and if we could speed it up to the point that it could help reduce climate change. What drew me most to my project is that it builds on a natural process. It's the Earth's own way of regulating atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. The problem is the Earth's process is too slow. It operates on thousands of years, uh, too slow to keep up with our carbon dioxide emissions. So I'm trying to figure out how to help Mother Nature move a little faster. And we think we can do this by injecting CO2 into the system. Uh, the biggest challenge with international fieldwork is learning to be flexible but persistent. You have limited data, so you can make the best of plans, but once you get on the ground, things are rarely as you expect. The wells I was planning to use were either collapsed or in the wrong rock type, so I had to spend two weeks driving around looking for new wells, but I was able to do that, and I was able to get the samples and the tests that I needed. I was always quite concerned about uh, global warming and climate change. Carbon dioxide uh, as a primary greenhouse gas has been identified as the main cause of these issues. So I really want to develop a, a system to enable their monitoring verification and uh, accounting to make sure their long-term um, variability of carbon capture and storage. This technology um, will make it po possible for the public to gain trust in the reliability and safety and permanence of carbon capture and uh, storage. Once we accomplish our laboratory scale evaluation, our next step will be some field tests in the, uh, of the developed carbon-14 um, targeting system in our carbon sequestration field in Iceland. And uh, upon the uh, successful demonstration of this technology, it can be uh, transitioned to industry for deployment and commercialization in the future. I'm working on wind turbine. I've always been a passionate sailor and I've always been fascinated by wind and by the energy you have in wind. So it was natural to be interested and to want to work on how to capture this energy. So what we're trying to do is since now wind turbines are very expensive, we're actually trying to rethink them. So if you want an example, we can use computers. You can choose to have a very advanced, very powerful computer, but it's also very expensive. Or you can choose to have lots of ordinary laptops and link them together you can end up with something as powerful but much cheaper. Well, we're doing the same thing with wind turbine. We're actually trying to shrink them and link them together to get something as powerful than a big turbine but much cheaper. So what is good about this subject is that a lot of interdisciplinary work is needed before we can actually create a prototype. And we could derive thousands of thesis just from our project so, for example, we actually need an economist or someone interested in economics to help us determine 
the cost of our uh, wind turbine to see if it's actually cheaper. We also need mechanical engineers to help us with all the driving parts. Uh, we need structural engineers uh, to help us with the design of the device. So I like that a lot of people could be involved in this project and not only me. Uh, so my project was an environmental evaluation of parks in New Jersey, uh, Newark, New Jersey. And so what that meant is we wanted to take a deep dive on kind of what benefits public parks provide to the citizens of the greater Newark area. And that includes environmental benefits uh, such as carbon abatement and tree cover to more social and health benefits like related to having exercise areas uh, for kids and families. And the last component was kind of see the economic growth uh, that we'd get from things like increased property values and uh, higher tourism rates. Uh, public parks and kind of uh, the state of sustainability in New Jersey has been a huge passion of mine. Uh, it was the topic of my first place submission for the Undergraduate Award of Ireland, and it's something that I kind of want to continue to work through uh, both professionally uh, and academically uh, over the rest of my time here at Columbia. I've gained some tremendous project leadership uh, and analytical skills that I think will be valuable uh, in any setting. Through the project, I gained a really solid understanding of the topic of environmental valuation, uh, everything from contil, uh, contingent valuation to revealed preferences to willingness to pay. Uh, my professor, my advisor, Professor Bose, has been a tremendous asset. Uh, he's provided me kind of the regulatory, legal, and financial framework to analyzing a set of complex issues. And I think as a result, uh, I've been able to kind of been more aware of how to attack a problem and also uh, manage a project uh, from kind of an executive level. My project in Bonsasso, Ghana was about assessing the water access and quality um, of the Bonsasso cluster in the last five years. I became interested in the subject um, after my experience in working in a township in South Africa and um, we were looking at how services were delivered to the township members and I wanted to know more about how in rural Ghana these services um, was also delivered and how um, Millennium Village Project was doing this. The local community um, benefited from this project because I did an interview of the water and sanitation boards of each community in the cluster and try to understand how the project, the water interventions, could be sustainable in the next five years. Um, and so by further doing this, um, the communities will be able to understand what works and what doesn't and also um, the Millennium Village Project um, sector coordinators can also um, see this and understand where to untake this project. I worked in the Millennium Village Project in the country of Senegal and there I worked on the nature reserve of Potu and I was tasked with developing a recommendations report for the business management and marketing plan and general organization of the reserve. The Potu Nature Reserve project is, is quite a long-term project. Um, there there's needs to be uh, the development of the fauna and it requires financing, it requires planning, but essentially it requires first and foremost the development of a local convention in accordance to the, the laws of the local community and the construct of the local community. The most interesting conclusion for related to the Potu Nature Reserve was the eagerness and willingness of the community leaders to develop this nature reserve that will benefit the community uh, in terms of employment and essentially the environment and, and preservation of the environment. So opportunities like this one, um, being able to put a, a designer that is based in New York in a Ugandan context is something that pretty much can spring a lot of ideas. One of those ideas for me was the sanitary pad. The sanitary pad was actually not even in the picture when I was sent to Uganda. It just sprang out of the one of the conversations that I had around the when I was given the tour around the village. Someone mentioned the fact that uh, girls drop out of school like 40% when they reach puberty, purity, just because they don't have access to sanitary uh, products. 
I felt goosebumps when I heard that number and as a designer and as a woman, I thought there must be something I can do. And I pretty much just say, how can I make my sanitary pad in materials that are locally available? So I say, okay, I need a, a waterproof material on the bottom. I need a, something permeable on the top. I run, I bought an umbrella, I cut it. I have the layer on the bottom. I took a mosquito net, I cut it and I make the piece on the top. I sew them both together and I create a pocket. That pocket that you can fill in with toilet paper or with a uh, cloth. I test, I test the first one, I test it with water and then I said, okay, this thing works. So I went and I did 50 prototypes, which we deploy in schools. And it was fantastic because um, the girls tried for like two months and they came back to us with our, our um, feedback. If we were going to give another set of pads, who wants the pads? And the funny thing is like the first, uh, the first samples we made, they were black and they were just complaining about the color. They say like, why is this has to be black? It's just so boring. So we just thought as like, okay, that there's any other complaint about it? And I said, no, this is fantastic. When can we ha can we have more? At least in the in the area that I'm talking about, which is social enterprise, it is really important that you are there, that you see you, and you are witness of the reality. That you definitely have into account what is it that this people is going through, and then you come up with solutions that address their issues within the surroundings and resources that you have around. So that is, I think, the huge value of projects like these. My final project began um, as a paper for Professor Paige West's Anthropology of Consumption Seminar of last semester. Um, in the context of the class, I was exploring the debate around the social and ecological impacts of genetically modified seeds, focusing specifically on the debate raging over the sale of those seeds to farmers in the developing world. Um, in reading the work of environmental anthropologists on the issue, I was intrigued and kind of struck by the potential anthropology had to contribute to our understanding of some of the more synthetic um, or sociocultural elements of the impacts of GM seeds. Um, and so my project was really conceived as a response to a call for an anthropological framing of these issues. Um, I worked in southern Mexico um, and I looked at the, um, the role maize plays in the cultural and agricultural traditions of the region, um, identifying how policy and um, a lively opposition movement have developed uh, with reference to those particular legacies um, which are unique to Mexico. Interestingly, I think the biggest challenge I encountered was learning not to stick to the plan. I think I went in with a bit of anxiety um, and gave myself this, this pretty strict schedule and list of specific questions that I wanted to have answered. Um, and pretty quickly realized that the, the value of fieldwork lies kind of precisely in your ability to articulate new questions based off of the information you encounter on the ground. And so I learned to not, not really let the questions limit me um, and to kind of act more of as a, a guide as I, as I went through this and in following the leads that, that presented themselves to me. Um, I was able to learn, I think, a lot more ultimately. Mm -hmm.